Dr. Thomas George, who is the Chief Consultant and Glaucoma Specialist at Chaitanya Hospital, Trivandrum. And uh, this is the third in the series of lockdown uh, lectures which we are having. So, Dr. Thomas George, please, you can start. Good evening, everybody. Today, uh, what I will be going through is basically the AO preferred practice pattern, explaining it a little bit. It's a little cryptic. So, I'll go through that and then proceed to what I would like to underline in the whole thing. So, established uh, risk factors for primary open-eye glaucoma are plenty. That is, age, race, uh, primarily they're talking about uh, African-Americans. Uh, level of IOP, family history, uh, low perfusion pressure, type 2 diabetes, etc. But not all these can be treated in the sense that we cannot modify quite a few of these. And what we do is, when there's the presence of these untreatable risk factors also, we get more aggressive about the treatable risk factors. Essentially, we can treat very eminently the intraocular pressure. If there's a low perfusion pressure also, we can do some things about it. And diabetes can be controlled. The rest, actually, we cannot control. But addition of those risk factors would make us more aggressive on the treatable risk factors. Primary opening uh, glaucoma uh, can happen with normal intraocular pressure, especially in certain races. Again, they have put the African Americans being at more at risk, but we know that NDG exists in our uh, situation also. And even in these patients, lowering intraocular pressure is beneficial. And when we say NTG, we are looking at pressures in the high normals quite often rather than a genuine low normal like 10 or 8 causing a glaucoma as such. Uh, characteristic uh, clinical features of an open angle glaucoma, this we all know, open angle, glaucomatous optic nerve head and retinal fiber changes. Uh, usually they are associated with visual field defects that corresponds to the nerve changes. Note that intraocular pressure is no longer in the definition it is only a risk factor. It is not a defining feature anymore. And about uh, computer-based imaging and stereo photography, it is still considered as preferable, but not a necessary. It's an adjunct to a good clinical examination. But I would say that these are important because clinical examination, what was said and done is subjective. And what is 0.5 today may look like 0.6 tomorrow when the same person looks at the optic disc itself. But if you got a photographic, uh, image to go by, it's easier to compare the previous image to the present one. And similarly, the, the OCT and HRT and all also help you in a similar way. It's not that they don't have fallacies, they do have them, but they do help us in follow -up. And computerized visual field is essential. And they do underline that uh, we need to decide which program we use on each patient. In advanced glaucoma, which doesn't have 10 degree field, it doesn't make sense to do a 30 degree field. It is not just that we are testing unseen areas, but when you take it, uh, it doesn't make sense to go for a 30 dash 2 for all patients because it's not just that we are uh, testing the unseen areas. When we take a 10 dash 2 program, we have many more points concentrating in the 10 degrees that we are testing. So a smaller change in that 10 degrees would be picked up in a 10 dash 2 as opposed to a 30 dash 2. So we have to decide the program depending on the severity of the field defects that exist in the patient. Again, uh, stimulus size also may need to be adjusted for the same reason. It is essentially for detecting as well as monitoring progression of the disease. And this is a uh, Clinical trials have shown that lowering intraocular pressure does help in slowing the progression of glaucoma, including normal tension glaucoma. And the next one is a superfluous statement actually. There's an effective medical laser and incisional surgery approaches are there for lowering IOP. We know that. We try all these approaches in a sequential manner to get to what we call a target intraocular pressure. The, a reasonable Initial change that we aim for is 20 to 30 percent reduction from baseline, and that is the new baseline on which we work. And if there's progression still, 
we go for adjusting for another 20 to 30 percent from the new baseline. That is essentially what the American Academy uh, practice, preferred practice guidelines say. But let me go into a few practical aspects. Uh, treatment of opening glaucoma is primarily medical and ankle closure is primarily surgical. But when we go for medical therapy, we have uh, how to institute therapy, reduction of side effects and compliance issues are what I will be uh, dwelling on mostly. First, I'll just run through the drugs that are there. Uh, we have got beta blockers. What I would like to uh, highlight here is uh, they reduce ex uh, ex uh, response to exertion, bronchospasm, and they can ma mask hypoglycemia. So even the normal person, Timolol can reduce your exertional tolerance. Parasympathomimetics rarely used in glaucoma, OAG now, but there are a few patients who do not uh, respond to anything other than that. What we have to worry about is a risk of RD should be, retinal detachment should be ruled out prior to putting out a patient on this drug. Alpha agonists, essentially they are good drugs, but they can cause follicular conjunctivitis in almost all the patients over a period of time. Potentiate allergies if they have allergic conjunctivitis. Small children, there is sleep apnea and also there is drowsiness. So if a person uh, who needs to stay awake at night for occupationally and things like that, it should not be given. This drowsiness is not something that you can fight. It is, you have to sleep right off that sort of a drowsiness. So you don't give it to a long distance driver, pilot and things like that. I've had a lot of patients coming here in the IT field saying that during work, I just have to take a nap for five minutes. That is what this does. Prostaglandin analogs, almost no systemic side effects, but they do have uh, congenital hyperemia, foreign body sensation, little irritating side effects like that. Uh, if you got a light colored iris, it may become a dark colored iris and of course long lashes are preferred. So it's okay. Epinephrine, depivephrine, not really popular anymore. Low kinase inhibitors are coming in uh, during the AOS, uh, some company has come in with either of these drugs, I forgot which one, it is coming in, but once again, uh, though it does work on multiple pathways, like uh, Bramundin, it reduces the episcleral venous pressure, that is the only excess that is there, it improves the trabecular outflow and can reduce the aqueous uh, inflow also a little bit, but both of these have got significant conjunctival hyperemia, so, and quite often they go on to develop uh, almost an allergic conjunctivitis and quite often we need to stop the drug in about a year or so. So if at all you got something to compare with it, it is your alpha agonists which again have similar situations. It is coming into the market, we may have it in Kerala so. Topical carbonic inhibitors, the only thing I would like to highlight here is in some susceptible patients, it does reduce endothelial function, so it can potentiate a coronal edema. These, both these drugs can do that, especially I've seen it with dorsolamide, but brinzolamide also is supposed to be able to cause coronal edema in susceptible patients. It's like an idiosyncratic reaction, not everybody gets it. So how do you institute treatment? Whom do we treat is the first question that should be there. And if you look at the OSTS trial, we found that 1 in 22 in ocular hypertensives with no, no field effects develop early field effects in 5 years. So let's assume that treatment does reduce this to 0 and absolute risk of early field effect is 1 by 22. So risk reduction is 1 by 22 minus 0 by 22, that is 1 by 22. What we essentially say is that if we treat 22 people with ocular hypertension, one person benefits in the form of not getting any field effect at all. Of course, the risk doesn't go to zero, so it's one almost one person benefits is what I should be saying. So the number needed to treat to get one benefit is 22 here. When we look at the EMG, the early management glaucoma trial, here we had early field effects and looking for progression. Early field effects are not really incapacitating, but uh, a progress field effect can be a handicap. So 1 in 7, so the risk reduction here becomes 1 by 7 and again we assume the treatment reduces to 0. 
So here, if it is seven people, one patient doesn't go on to develop a significant field defect that would interfere with this daily function. So you put two and two together, uh, you got 22 of ocular hypertensives needing to be treated so it doesn't uh, fulfill the EMGT criteria and seven of them if treated would uh, cause us to prevent one visually significant field loss. So if we multiply the two, we got a 154 ocular hypertensives to be treated over 10 years to get to this benefit and that doesn't make sense. This is why we need to do other, other tests like corneal thickness, OCT, HRT and things like that. You're adding risk factors. If a person is more at risk, you would err on the side of treating an ocular hypertensive. If a person doesn't have any other risk factors, you would err on the side of just observing. So you need to maintain follow-up on any, any person with risk factors. And ocular hypertension would be just a risk factor. The real issues here actually is if you start treatment with any drug, you've got to deal with the side effects of the drug. You're putting the patient at risk of side effects of the drug. Plus, this is long-term treatment, so the cumulative cost of treatment is significant. And of course, you label a patient as a person with a disease, he may cut down on his night driving, something in his life would change, and that also is not good for the patient. He would cut down probably playing tennis or something else. Or, and of course, you, when we start treating, we would follow him up more, we would uh, end up doing more fields. So there is an opportunity cost in terms of time for the health machinery. But also, you send a patient off with no treatment, he may think everything is fine and reappear 10-15 years down the line. So starting treatment also has a small benefit in keeping him uh, compliant to follow up. Also, if you start a treatment, he is more likely to come back to you as well. So personally, any ocular hypertensive with more than 30 pressures with absolutely healthy disc also, I would treat. With any field effect, with the disc that suggests uh, glaucoma, with the highest pressure, I would treat. The rest of them, if there are additional risk factors, I would tend to treat more often than not. And if the patient can follow up regularly, I would treat, uh, keep them more, or more likely on follow up rather than treat. If the patient is not likely to come for follow up, I would err on the side of treatment still. So what is the end point of treatment? We have to aim at something when we are starting a long-term treatment and the primary endpoint is what we call a target intraocular pressure. We need to bring the pressure down under something like 25 anyway. Otherwise, we are aiming at 20 to 30 percent reduction from baseline. And now this is the new baseline on which we are going to be uh, working on. If there is progression of uh, the clinical features, disc and field, you would have to reduce the baseline from the baseline that we have created now with treatment by another 20 to 30 percent. And achieving pressures well under 15 is more likely to be done with surgery than medically. So that is another decision you would think a lot before actually doing. We think a lot before we actually start deciding on cutting up and uh, that is a more thought out decision. When we combine drugs, when we combine two drugs, each of them individually may be able to give us 20 to 30 percent reduction in intraocular pressure. But when we add a second drug, we do not get 30 percent reduction from what we achieved with the first drug. We usually end up with around 10 percent reduction on top of what we achieved. Say we started with uh, 20, we would land up with something like uh, 16. And if you want to reduce it further, the next drug is going to get you at around 14 odd not beyond that. But both the drugs are going to add up their side effects. So whenever possible, if one drug is not adequate, prefer to switch to a new group of drugs. And if that doesn't work, is when we go for a combination. We can try the combination of multiple drugs and then decide that the next refill should be the combination in a single bottle. That's also possible. We all know that uh, not all patients respond equally to each of these drugs and long-term fluctuation in intraocular pressure is more the role than 
the exception. So glaucomatous damage also takes years, usually decades to happen. So follow up there also is not uh, going to give us an answer. And drastically getting the pressure down in two weeks is not what we're aiming at. We're aiming at getting it down or a period of time and keeping it down for a period of time. So always I would like to have a control eye to compare with and that's very easy when you've got a two-eyed patient and that's a unilateral therapeutic trial. You start the drug only in one eye, see them after a certain amount of time and see if there's a difference between the two eyes. If the patient dehydrates also, you will get a low eye and pressure. That's not necessarily a therapeutic effect. So for pilocarpin, a gap of two hours is enough. You can do it in an OPD itself. That's the easiest of them, but the rarest used drug now. Prostaglandins, you can get a difference between the two eyes in about a week's time. Two to seven days is what they say. Beta blockers, you need to wait for uh, three weeks, as is the case with alpha agonists. So essentially, if you can start the drug in one eye and see the patient again and see that there's a difference between the two eyes and then start, you're more confident that your drug is actually working and not a long-term fluctuation in drug blood pressure that you're looking at. And you would be saved a lot of uh, surprises at the next visit. Because the long-term fluctuation, you've started drugs in both eyes, you think you're okay, and the next visit, the IOP is back to where we started and you've got to explain to the patient. So next thing that I would like to uh, go into is reduction of side effects. Just like we go after risk factors of the disease, if we go in the history adequately, quite often we can preempt or expect side effects with certain groups of drugs and avoid them. That is asthma, heart disease, uh, more of rate anomalies rather than coronary artery disease as far as glaucoma is concerned because you're looking at that for beta blockers, hypertension and its treatment. There are two reasons why you go after that. Nocturnal hypertension can be a risk factor which we need to go after. And if the patients are on systemic beta blockers, 80% of the receptors in the eye are already blocked. Your timolol is not going to add much to it. Drug allergies to, uh, that are already known, previous topical medicines, previous systemic medicines, both of the past records, you may find something that could preempt a side effect and that would go a long way in reducing side effects. Next, of course, we all know about punctal occlusion. Reduce systemic absorption and you reduce your systemic side effects. Uh, close your eyes gently, wipe off the excess and press near the medial canthus to occlude the canaliculum, uh, uh, canaliculi rather than the punctum. And do not squeeze your lids and start your lacrimal pump mechanism. And 10 to 30 seconds, the excess is already flowed out. So 30 seconds is what we advise punctal occlusion for after putting a drop. Then we have compliance issue. This is one issue that we need to address for chronic diseases and diseases that are susceptible to non-compliance typically is a chronic one, which is initially asymptomatic. The typical one that we think about is diabetes mellitus and uh, POAG definitely is in this group because the progression is over years and decades and not in days a patient doesn't find a problem till he can't read, which is the last bit that he's got. If the patient had a myocardial infarction or a status asthmatic or something that's really putting him into discomfort, he would definitely be compliant, but not with stuff like primary opening glaucoma. So we need to work on compliance in these patients. And the typical population can be split into six. That is, there are these OCD patients who would be Perfect adherence to the regime that we say to the dot, to the hour, to the minute, they'll be putting drugs. And then they will be take all doses, but I forgot to put in the morning, so I'll put it twice in the evening, that sort of thing, irregular timing. Then there are a few who would miss doses, miss timings, and then there are a few that will miss doses over a period of time, three or four times a year, and you come to a worse situation where this happens every month and then there are a few that take no doses and claim perfect adherence to the regime and these people are the ones to really dig out because they also do what is called white coat adherence. That is they treat the tests that we do, intraocular pressure, as an exam in school. So three, four days before coming to the hospital, the
three four days before coming to the hospital, they would put the drops, and the intraocular pressure would be normal. So the methods of surveillance is history with the patient, with the bystander. Check when the patient bought the drug and he is still using the same bottle. Uh, that's a sort of I estimate on whether he is compliant. Rate of buying, you know, approximately once a month they should be buying a bottle of medicines as far as often drugs are concerned. And of course, your clinical response, intraocular pressure. You can ask the patient to keep a di diary. Ask the bystander to look at what's happening. Blood assays don't really matter to us because we don't do that. Compliance can be improved drastically by patient education, repeated health education on multiple visits, and mind you, better than your sister telling the patient is a doctor telling the patient, and the patient should feel that you care for them. So you give them your phone number and that gives them access to you at any time. 99% of the patients do not ring me up, but they have my number. And if you have a doubt, please ring me up. That is showing concern, empathy to the patient. That's why the patient is concerned. That repo is what is going to take you a long way in compliance. Thank you. We you know if anybody wants to ask anything, and if you have time. You can yeah, participants, uh, you know, if anybody has any doubt, they can unmute themselves and ask, ask the doubts. Uh, yeah, let me. How do you exit sharing? Okay, I have exited. Now, oh, too big. Okay. I think it's a very straightforward, basic uh, talk. So No, everybody knows glaucoma. It's not like retina. Uh, so then you come to the market, right? Ripasudil. Hello. Ripasudil is coming in the market. There's some company, but I don't think there's. Uh, they have brought it to Kerala yet. AAO is one company. Was I forgot which company also? Ajanta had in the AAO. Ajinta. Ajinta. Yeah. It doesn't reach me. I have not used it yet. Any other question? Yeah, nothing. Actually, uh, since it is glaucoma, I am keeping my mouth shut. Hey, Mahesh knows man. Come on. Just one question from my wife. Yeah, yeah. Prokinase can be given as a combination along with other drugs. Is there any effectiveness for that? Uh, it is just one more drug to add to the whole thing. It can be combined with other drugs. Um, let, though we know that the first line that is approved by FDA is prostaglandin and beta blockers. We, we quite often mix and match everything and get additional effect. So Rokinase also, uh, it is been proven to be non-inferior to timolol as far as the intraocular pressure reduction is concerned with uh, single drug therapy. Okay. And uh, when you add the drug, I would expect like when you get 20 to 30 percent is what we expect with timolol. So you should expect rokinase to give us 30 percent as a single drug. But when you combine, I would expect probably 10 to 15 percent, not more. Okay. Than that. 
when we started um, um, along with the other three drugs can we give it as a fourth drug it's a fourth drug you can add yeah okay. and when it's a fourth drug you'll get 5% uh, not more than that okay, okay. and uh, it hyperemia and follicular conjunctivitis and contact dermatitis almost invariably appears in one one year 80% of the patients that's what the japanese have found okay uh, so it's not uh, expected to be a very comfortable drug for long term but it does work you may get away with it okay okay hello yes hello uh this is uh, i just wanted to have a question to us uh, you check progression as a local progression analysis yeah, yeah. your audio is breaking how a bit you, uh, how do you check the progression between things or progression analysis edwin yeah. uh, pro- probably you should whatsapp the question i look at it and it is breaking oh. no? uh, your audio is breaking up Can you hear me? Uh sort of uh, t- tell. Yeah. Uh how do you check for progression is it uh, visual field glaucoma progression analysis or there's a new method there's a vascular density in um uh angiography okay angiography yeah angiography i mean we get enamored by anything that comes new that is something that is being studied but that is still studied as a risk factor that is before all these so we are not into treating that yet okay but It's you do check the proportion of this yeah we we are not sure of the position of oct angiography that uh, 12 quadrant 4 quadrant measurements or rather counting we are not sure of its place in glaucoma yet okay it is assumed that it is even Thank before you. your nerve fiber layer defects are picked up but we don't know yes yes a lot of normative Thank data have to come what is the normal pattern how to Uh, vessel density how to find out uh, even in uh, retina uh, octa is not standardized oh. and mahesh after the normative comes you need to figure out what is progression yes so it takes another uh, probably 5 years 8 years like that no this glaucoma is 10 years at least to show progression okay fine so <laughs> so for analyzing progression that's going to be a long way from now it still feels at this Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, uh, Rajiv? Anybody is? Yeah. Unmute, sir. Sir, unmute. Unmute yourself. Vinay Mohan sir, unmute. Ah, yeah, yeah. I know. Oh, Thomas, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, sir. I guess just for a general question, what is your drug of preference for the first, uh, time when you see a first patient? Like life, first line. Uh, first, first line now for me would be any of the prostaglandin analogs. There's nothing to choose between all three that are available here. Uh, okay. or other four because tafelo that tafelo process is also available now there's nothing to choose between them uh, primarily because it has been labeled as first line along with the beta blockers and beta blockers have significant side effects even in a normal person it reduces effort tolerance and uh, most of kerala is diabetic so it can mask hypoglycemia so it's a little on the dangerous side though the cost is an issue but cost is no longer that much of an issue as it was with prostaglandins 10 15 years ago so i would prefer yeah. prostaglandins as first line and you add on second drug 
second drug if there is no contraindication uh, medically to uh, beta blockers that is my second second line the second drug that we add on a second line that i would look at because these two actually give you the maximum pressure reduction exactly and yeah. then it would be a, a toss between bromonidin and uh, one of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors having said that i got about five patients who did not respond to anything but pilocarpine open eye glaucoma that is why we need to do a therapeutic trial and if it doesn't work try the next one i got five patients on pilocarpine if pilo goes off the market i'm doing trabeclectomy that's sort of five patients are there. i see okay. how frequently you repeat the i mean fields and oct or whatever you are uh, sort of surviving uh, OCT maybe once in two years or something is all I do. I do not do it every year even. Feels once I've got a reliable baseline and a stable patient, I do not suspect that it's progressing clinically. I would do once a year, but to achieve the baseline reliably, I may repeat it over three months or over one monthly for three months to get it for me to be sure that I've got the baseline. And at any point, if the patient says something like. any visual symptom or i feel that there is something new in the disc i would repeat the field the decision to repeat the field for clinical reasons are there but routine once a year is all i do okay. what is Thank recommended you. is once in 6 months once it's stable but i do only once a year okay thank you thomas i am locked down in ludhiana actually <laughs> so uh, uh, don't get out the tops there are more strong I don't know when I am going to come back there to see you guys. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody. okay. Bye stay safe, sir. Yeah, see you. Stay safe. Stay home. Yep. Bye. No questions. Yes. No question. Which is ideal drug in pregnancy? Okay. ideal drug in uh, pregnancy ideal drug in pregnancy yeah the fact of the matter is timolol is still the safest one to give in pregnancy because one prostaglandins in the package insert says it's contraindicated in pregnancy though it's not the same prostaglandin that causes abortion that is why it is there so legally we should not be giving it and uh, timolol doesn't cause much of a problem during pregnancy but uh, but uh, bromonidin can be given till the last trimester you have to change because it will cause uh, apnea in the newborn so timolol will be the safest and then you would consider bromonidin first two trimesters not in the third there is no specific thing about dorsolamide and at uh, brinzolamide but being less effective than the other one you would hold that as second line okay that is assuming timolol doesn't have contraindication to the patient you are treating to start with huh? yes. non pregnant contraindications